Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I'm going to be giving you a spoiler-free review of The Genesis of Misery by Neon Yang. The Genesis of Misery is a space opera that is retelling the life of Joan of Arc, but in space. It's a smart, nuanced book with detailed world building that is steeped in religious language, themes, culture, and ideas. So this is definitely something where having some kind of a Judeo-Christian religious background is going to benefit you and you'll probably get a lot more out of the reading experience. Additionally, some familiarity with the historical story of Joan of Arc is, I think, helpful in getting the full picture of what this book is trying to do, where it's subverting things, and what is so interesting about this book. You could pick this up without knowing much about Joan of Arc or knowing much about the religious themes, but I do think that it does a disservice to the nuance of what this book is trying to accomplish. Joan of Arc has always been something of a gender nonconformist. She stepped outside of the roles that were expected for her, and the only reason that she got away with it in her time was because of her visions being called by God. Now this book more actively explores this idea of gender nonconformity or gender fluidity, which I'm not too surprised to see. Nian Yang is a trans and non-binary author, and their earlier works have also explored ideas of gender and gender identity. So I came into this expecting to see that as some kind of an element to this story. Our heroine's name is Misery, and so the title of the story can be read on multiple levels. In some sense, this is about the beginnings of Misery, our Joan of Arc character, hence her genesis, her beginning. This is a story being told by someone else. We eventually find out who is telling the story, but it is being told from Misery's perspective for fun sci-fi reasons. Additionally, Genesis is the first book in the Bible, and again, this ties in with a lot of the religious themes that we see through the book. One thing that I wanted to point out about the cover that I think is pretty cool, whoever designed it, is it mirrors these kinds of old paintings of Jesus and the Virgin Mary. If you notice, baby Jesus was often positioned holding up one or two fingers. I think it's a sign of divinity. Uh, note that the white on the angel looks like a halo behind the head of misery, and the white or pure kind of looking angel behind, and the moon in the background almost looks like a halo as well. So I think whoever did this cover design did a fantastic job and it really fits with the book. I will say this is a book that is a little bit on the dense and slow side in terms of reading. I quite enjoyed it. I loved all of the themes. I loved the character work and the development of the politics and all of the various things that were going on. The world building details are really rich and interesting in terms of the use of AI and technology versus what we think of as almost magic or the way that religion can interact with things that we don't understand. There are also giant mech robots that are modeled on biblically accurate angels, which is interesting if you know anything about biblical accurate angels. And there are for sure some mysterious things going on in the story. Misery begins this believing that she is hallucinating this angel who comes to her in visions. Her mother had delusions and died due to this thing called void sickness when she was a little girl, which was very traumatic for her, and so she believes that she has the same thing infecting her. So what's interesting is that at the beginning of the story, Misery is acting as if she thinks that she has been this chosen prophesied person, but in reality she thinks she's delusional. She doesn't think any of it is real. And that's an ongoing question in the story. Is it reality? Is it delusion? Is it artificial intelligence? What exactly is going on? And it kind of keeps you guessing in some interesting ways. And I'm very excited to see where the rest of the series is going to go. I believe book two is slated for 2024, so it's going to be a while before it's out. But given the ending of this book, I am for sure anxious to see where Nian Yang is going to take us in book two. So I read Genesis of Misery with a couple of friends, including Angela at the Literature Science Alliance, and neither of them had a lot of religious background. And so what I noticed about our conversations as we were discussing this book and our reactions to the book is I think I had a better time with this book because I do have a heavier religious background. I went to a Christian school, I went to a Christian university, I've taken classes, 
classes in the Bible and theology, so I'm very familiar with a lot of the things that Neon Yang is doing and subverting in this book, and I think that is part of what made it really work for me. I also think there is a certain point in the book where Misery undergoes a change, and it does affect their personality. It affects the way that they present themselves. For reference, Misery uses she and they pronouns, and it's interesting to notice when she or they use different pronouns in the book. I think the use of pronouns in this is really fascinating. But one thing that I found in these conversations as we were reading through the book is that while I wasn't bothered by that change, it made sense to me. It was literally referred to as her apotheosis or revelation of divinity, kind of mirroring the life of Jesus in some ways and his baptism and then being revealed as divine. So to me it made sense. Misery has undergone this transformation of rebirth and of course the way that they're thinking now will be different from what it was previously but for my friends who didn't have that same grounding it was much less obvious and much more jarring of a personality change which is interesting to me because I don't know that we always consider how much we bring to the table when we read books especially books like this one I do think that there are probably a lot of assumptions and sort of filling in that I'm leaping to because of my background that perhaps people with a different background might struggle to connect the dots on. And you know similarly there have been books that I've read where I've been told by people who are from the background of the author that there were things that I missed that to them seemed really obvious because of their cultural expectations or because of what they were bringing to the table. So I think that perhaps one weakness of this book is that there might not be quite enough scaffolding to understand exactly what Neon Yang is doing for people who don't have that kind of knowledge coming in. On the other hand, I really loved this book. It worked for me. I think it's smart. It's interesting. It's something that I could see myself rereading. And I think the tone worked for me as well. And this is something too that seems to be hit and miss for people. The Genesis of Misery evokes some of the style and feel of classic space operas in the sci-fi genre while also having a lot of modern sensibilities and even very modern language. This is something looking at reviews that I think bothers some people if you don't like seeing modern language and slang used in sci-fi books that you may not enjoy that element of the story. Personally I'm not bothered by it. I think it's an interesting thought experiment of how might language stay with us and adapt over time and assume that this is perhaps in humanity's future, which I think we get some nods that it might be. It's just not a thing that bothers me, but it is a thing that seems to bother some people. This book is moving towards exploring humanity's fear of AI, as well as the ways that we tend to create myth and even religion around things that are unexplainable or things that we don't really understand, even if perhaps there is a scientific explanation for them. And I think that is a running theme that you see the more you learn about the history of the people, of the magical technology that they're using, especially within the church, you realize how much of the this mythos and these religious ideas were sort of built up around what was probably just an alien technology that they didn't understand. But who knows? Maybe not. We, we don't really know. There are definitely some unanswered questions. Another theme that you see in this book is the idea that history is mutable. It's something that is partly determined by who is telling the story and how dramatically it can change depending on the teller. This includes things like religious or governmental propaganda where they want to create an enemy and might therefore fudge the details of things that actually happened and how you end up with people on two different sides of a religious political struggle who hate each other and it's really hard to bridge that gap. There's a lot of really rich ideas and themes in here, a lot of religious imagery and language that's used. It's the sort of book that I know is not going to be for everyone. This is not going to be everybody's cup of tea, but it was definitely for me. It was definitely a book that I loved a lot, and I think if it sounds like it might be for you, it is for sure worth a look. I think that this is a book that is 
a good one to read with other people. Again, because there's so many layers to what's going on, there are so many sort of blink and you miss it moments. I think reading it with other people where everybody's going to catch different pieces of it is really useful and could enrich your understanding and enjoyment of the book. That was certainly my experience. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given the identity of the author, this is a queer norm society. It is expected that in introductions people share their pronouns. People have all different kinds of sexual orientations and it's very normalized, which I appreciate. I think this is in some ways taking the best things from traditional classic space operas and really modernizing them and putting a fresh spin on them. So that is the genesis of Misery. Let me know in the comments down below any of your thoughts. If you've read this book, what you thought about it, what you thought of the ending, I would love to chat about it. And if this review helped you decide whether or not this is going to be the book for you, I would also love to hear about it in the comments below because I know it's not going to be for everyone, but I think there is for sure a cohort of people who would love it the way that I did. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.